welcome Bob Rubin, Rob Christopher, and Barry Gifford. Um, well, the first question is 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 to uh, to Rob and to and to Barry. Uh, my understanding is that Barry did not want a documentary uh, made about him when you when you approached him. So can you to explain uh, how the film uh, happened? Actually? Yeah, that's correct. Um, well, first I started off by telling Barry what I didn't want to do which is I didn't want to have a bunch of talking heads. I didn't want to just have a bunch of, you know, celebrity endorsements, um, turning it into a kind of infomercial about his work. I wanted it to be really centered on the stories himself. Um, and I also, for that reason, didn't want to show Barry on screen. I just wanted his voice, his voice, um, you know, both, Barry Gifford himself, and also uh, the stories. And uh, I guess Barry liked that idea because he uh, sort of trusted me to do the right thing and just kind of left it in my hands. Well, I'm happy to give Rob all the credit for making this film, which I like. You know, the thing was, as I recall it, uh, Rob was talking to me about doing some biographical thing, whether it might have been a book, it might have been a film, something like this. But anyway, I do remember thinking that uh, there had been a couple of other documentaries made about me and my work in France and Italy, and they were the usual thing, as Rob was describing, talking heads, that sort of business, interviews with me, and, uh, you know, I didn't want that. And so we were in total agreement. But I said, listen, you know, since the concentration here is on Roy and the Roy stories, I want you to make a film, if you're going to do it, about the character, not about Barry Gifford per se. Anyway, so we were in total agreement with that. My, my, my feeling was he's never going to be able to do this. He won't be able to do it. I mean, because it's a tough assignment, you know, to tell somebody, okay, you can make a film about me, but I don't want to be in it. And I don't want any people talking about me in it. So how do you do that? And you concentrate on the main character here in, in Roy. And I had a book coming out called Roy's World. And I said, well, there you go. So you have your title and good luck. And to, really, and to my surprise, you know, when he came out to a screening room in San Francisco where I live to show it to me and a selected few people, I thought that I'd look at it and I'd say, well, okay, thanks, man, let's go have a beer. And it wasn't that way at all. I mean, to my surprise, and happily so, I took it seriously. I mean, he somehow he managed to pull it off. You know, so all congratulations go to Rob Christopher. How did you make your way into the into the stories? I mean, you 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 selected some of them. You 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 found this balance between the reading fr directly from the story, his interview. I mean, how did you uh, found the structure of 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 the film? Well, um, the best thing and the worst thing about the starting of a film is you don't know what the hell you're doing. But that's exactly the place you want to start a film from. Because if uh, I'm quoting from uh, Philip Glass's memoir, if you know what you're doing, then nothing much of interest is going to happen. It's only when you don't know what you're doing, when you have to like make the film to discover how to make the film, that something good is going to happen. So um, Barry's been writing these stories for more than 40 years, so there were literally hundreds to choose from. Um, I started with just um, the ones that resonated with me personally, and um, just printed them all out, and um, just sort of um, swapped the orders that they went in until they had some sort of a flow. Um, and very early on in the project, um, I flew out to meet Barry in uh, Berkeley and 
we recorded three days worth of interviews, so like seven hours of basically oral history. And I knew that I was going to be able to draw from those recordings as a sort of connective tissue between the two stories. So it was really just interweaving those um, in a way that they uh, flowed together. Um, th the person that uh, brought this, this film to my attention is, uh, is Bob Rubin. And, and when he did, he said, and by the way, the stories are incredible. And, I, and I'm embarrassed to say that, uh, you know, as I, I knew uh, Barry Gifford's work on The Sailor and Lula because of Wild at Heart, I had never read the stories. And they are wonderful. I mean, they are magnificent. What makes them so special, I'm asking Bob. And then I want to ask Barry, how did you find Roy, this character? So you started writing his story when you were 11. I mean, I think the first book was published in 73, but you were writing uh, the story as, a, as, as, a, as an adolescent. Let's hear what Bob has to say, first of all. And I think Bob actually deserves great credit for this because he was the guy who helped uh, Rob begin this film, begin to make the film. The only thing I do want to say is that it's funny to hear Rob say this, not knowing what to do, you know, that you know nothing when you start writing the film. I said, well, that's, that's kind of the way I feel when I start writing a novel or writing a series of stories like this, which really is a novel in disguise, in a sense. But I feel the exact opposite about making a film. With making a film, I think, you know, you got to have that blueprint. You have to have that, you know, scenario and that screenplay ready to go because otherwise there's too much money at stake. When you start writing a book, there's no money at stake. It doesn't matter. It's not the same. Anyway, Bob, hi. Hi, Barry. Nice to see you. Well, to answer your question, I thought I had a pretty deep knowledge of the varied career of Barry Gifford. He's written uh, the great novels that were the basis of Wild at Heart. He collaborated with David Lynch. He uh, wrote about uh, B-movies. He started a, a noir publishing company. Um, he, he's written about uh, culture. I must confess that a lot of the presentation I made here about uh, One-Eyed Jacks was cribbed from one of Barry's books. So, you know, I, I, I have a, a, a lot of Barry under my belt. And when I read the Roy stories, um, I was I was really bowled over. They were they were quite different. I I, I would describe them as uh, as as miniature bonbons that 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 pack a cumulative wallop. I mean, each of these stories is no longer than I think four pages, and most of them are just a page or two. And you can you can buy the book on the way out here. By the way, it's the the last the last collection is six or seven hundred pages and. The effect of reading these stories is just overwhelming. I mean, we spend our time reading books that are way too long and way too complicated. And the, 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 the apparent simplicity of these stories and the, the resonance that hits you afterwards is, is just amazing. And I think Rob's film does a terrific job with the voiceovers and the visuals of bringing that out. I mean, I could feel in the audience that, you know, you're kind of, where is this simple little narrative going? And then all of a sudden, boom, you know, they're, they're great. So Barry, uh, how, did you, how did you find Roy? Uh, and, and why did you, uh, do you still, uh, is still a, a, a present in your, in your writing? Well, you were right when you said, you know, I did start writing when I was 11. And uh, the Roy stories, you know, came along piecemeal. And uh, finally, in 1973, uh, I published the first of them. And uh, then I just kept going. And over the years, you know, I started adding to what was called a boy's novel at the time, the last of the of the Roy books that the last one that was just published this year is called The Boy Who Ran Away to Sea. And I give, and the credit for that goes to my wife, Mary Lou, because that's how she used to describe me. Because when I was 18, I left the country and I started working on ships, on cargo ships. And so I did. I, I was the boy who ran away to sea. And then, you know, after I'd met her and she would introduce me to people and we got together, she'd say, oh yeah, this is Barry. He's the boy who ran away to sea. 
So 50 something years later, I used it as a title. Uh, in any case, that, you know, I said earlier that really these stories, uh, it's a novel disguised as stories. So being individual chapters in a way and the structure being elliptical, there's no conscious effort to make it chronological. And uh, that's kind of the way I like it. And one thing I, I want to say in deference to what Rob was talking about earlier about a film is I never want to know what's going to happen at the end. I don't care if I'm writing a Sailor and Lula novel or it's the Roy stories. I, I want to know what's going to happen. It's a mystery to me. And I want to keep it that way. So I'm writing towards something and I don't know what it is, as opposed to a you know, a, a thriller writer like Mickey Spillane was. I don't know if anybody in the audience remembers Mickey Spillane, but he was a very popular writer in the 40s and 50s. He wrote the Mike Hammer novels. Uh, but in any case, Mickey Spillane, I once heard him say that the first thing he would write was the ending to one of his novels. So he knew what he was heading toward. So I'm just the opposite. Was it was it how how uh, easy is to have kept the perspective of a of a boy essentially because I I think Roy goes from five to like seventeen sixteen seventeen, um, which is pretty much the same age that you left Chicago. Am I am I right? Would you, would That's you, would you, yeah. So so how do you keep the perspective of a of a of a essentially a young boy uh, for forty years because they they do feel like the point of view of a of a boy. And, and still still to, to today. It, it doesn't matter if you wrote them two years ago or, or 30. <laughs> well, you know, that's the mystery of it, isn't it? I mean, the fact that I can still identify with that character and who that person is. But as I go along, actually, you'll see uh, in the stories that there are some stories where Roy has a different perspective and he's older. And so there are some shifts in terms of time, in term of, terms of perspective and like that. But basically, yes, it starts out when Roy is five and ends pretty much when he's 17. And then the boy went away to sea. And, and, and Rob, the, the, uh, the, the visuals of the film are incredibly elaborate. Can you, can you talk a little bit about the work you did on, on archive? Because obviously Chicago is a big, is a big character. Uh, of of uh, of the story and the way you and you know enriched the uh, the the, uh, the narrations and the and the uh, and, and, and the tales the stories with uh, with archival and, and also animation the introduction of animation. Um, well, I guess to start uh, answering your question, um, last night I rewatched uh, True Stories, the David Byrne film, which is has been my favorite film since the age of 12. And um, w the most important thing that film taught me is you can take things from completely different places and just by putting them next to each other, the audience will create a connection between them. And so my job as the filmmaker was to pour over you know, thousands of photos and hundreds of different clips um, from that period and just to see what would, you know, resonate on its own. But then um, combined with Barry's words and the music would make something really beautiful. Like, you know, you take all these strands and you put, it, put them together and it creates something wonderful. So it was just a... Um, a question of finding the right balance. Um, and a lot of that involved just going to lots of different archival sources. Um, Barry provided a lot of his uh, home movies and personal photos from the period, which were a really great help to sort of get the sort of a baseline of the tone I wanted. Um, and, you know, with archival research, you can definitely look for specific things, but the most beautiful things um, are uncovered when you just keep your eyes open. Like that, um, the police training um, film that's in the, you know, this is not what you should do, you should not take bribes. 
you know, if you're a cop. When I saw that, I basic, you know, I started like doing um, backflips basically because that's the exact kind of thing you could, if you were looking for something like that, you could never find it. But if you just keep your eyes open, then these beautiful accidents present themselves to you and you can find a way to put them in the film. And what about the animation? Oh yeah, the animation. So um, when I started the project, I had no idea there was gonna be animation. That was like the furthest thing from my mind. Um, but I don't know, maybe uh. nine months into the film, somebody made an offhand suggestion. Oh, you know, I've seen these documentaries and they, they uh, have been incorporating animation. And then it was just like, why didn't I think of that before? Because one of the things I wanted to do is, um, as Bob mentioned, some of the stories are uh, quite short and very self-contained. So I thought that there were at least a couple stories I wanted to present completely uncut. And uh, doing an animated segment was the way to make that happen. So. First, I found Lily Carre, who did the beautiful black and white segment. And she suggested uh, Kevin, who did the color segment. And I didn't allow the two animators to look at each other's work, because I wanted it to be completely different from each other. Um, the black and white segment is when Roy is a lot younger, so it has more of a sort of innocent um, childhood kind of feeling to it. And the color one is when Roy's a little older, so we're moving into the 60s, so we could do stuff like rotoscoping and stuff like that. And when did you uh, decide uh, that about the last, the last shot, the long shot inside, you know, when you're revealing uh, your, your, I think your, your work face, your studio, where you write, and then all the things, and then you come to him. Did you come to a, uh, together on it, or it's something that you had, had in mind at the beginning? <laughs> That was sort of the compromise that Barry and I came to. Like, um, I, you know, didn't want to have him as a talking head in the movie, but I thought, oh, well, I'll just kind of show his workspace at the end. And, you know, in the very last moment, you kind of see him in silhouette a little bit. Um, and that was really just about, um, okay, you've experienced all these amazing stories for the last hour. So, Here's like the real world setting where a lot of these stories came to life, basically. Um, and it was, for me, it was just a beautiful tour of what that space is like. Uh, raise your hand. I, I have a little bit of the light here, so I don't see. So wave if you, if you have questions to, uh, to ask. I have one. There. And my, my question is probably incredibly obscure, but I can't get it out of my head. And it's, a, it's, a dis it's about visual decision making. The, uh, the animation scene, which ends with the deep uh, throat kiss. The way you visualized it was two flat planes coming together, one floral wallpaper kind of thing and one just blank. And I was sitting there the whole time thinking, is there ever going to be penetration <laughs> of that space? And I, I, I know it's a funny question, but from a visual perspective, to end with that hard edge between something that actually was a, you know, a merging uh, uh, of the two bodies seems like a really complicated decision. Was it for you or was it like? Well, I really have to give most of that credit to Kevin who um, designed that whole sequence. Um, as far as how the story was going to end, um, the first draft he gave me of that particular moment was a lot more <laughs> explicit <laughs> and I said, Okay, I think that's maybe going over the line a little too much because I wanted ma I wanted to make sure that Barry's punchline at the very end of the story was something that everyone would notice. So I had him kind of tone that down a little bit. Um, and uh, that for me, that sequence is all, is all about, um, 
you know, you're a kid walking through a cemetery and you're talking with this girl and all of these images are kind of floating through your head and they're abstract. And so I kind of wanted to keep the ending on that sort of abstract plane, I think. I mean, if I could jump in, I would say some of us might remember that the first time we were tongue kissed, it didn't feel like penetration, it felt like intrusion, right? So <laughs> maybe the hard edge line is uh, more appropriate there. <laughs> maybe that's too much information. <laughs> um, I, I have a question for, um, for, uh, for, for Barry. Barry, how important, I mean, you wrote a, a, a great book about noir, uh, you know, cinema is, is part of your creative process at, 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 at this point. How important was cinema for you when you grew up? Well, first I want to say something about uh, the ending of Roy's World, the film. You know, when Rob came and he was shooting around my studio, panning around, or whoever the, the camera guy yeah, was was panning around and all, and then it ends in that where I, it's me and I'm in shadow, but you don't see me. And of course, I had said to Rob in the beginning, I don't want to be in the film, but I thought poetically, if you will, it comes to fruition because the writer disappears. It's the work that remains. And that's all that matters. And that's why the film is about Roy. And the fact that, yeah, there's the guy who perpetrated all this, in a sense. But I just disappear into the shadows. So if that isn't noir, I don't know what is. <laughs> well, it's, it's also beautiful because the shot is through your all your work, you know, it shows the work, it shows the inspiration, it shows what surrounds you when you, uh, you know, what you have created and, and what surrounds you when you do so. So I think it's incredibly evocative. I'm personally, I'm very happy you agree to it. It, 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 it it's, a, it's a logical end to, to, uh, to the film. It's funny because, you know, when I had not the studio that I have now that Rob shot in, I've had the last 10 years, but for almost 30 years, I had a different studio space, a loft, and uh, for years, you know, my kids would go in there and my kids were little and they had their own desk and they would sit there and do their drawings or whatever it is like that. And sometimes they would do, you know, and I'd put up a lot of these, you know, and so the, the room basically was papered like this. And then one day my, my son, who was then five or six, he did a drawing and he says, here, Pop, put this up. And I looked at it and I said, no, no, this isn't going up. And he looked at me with this puzzled expression on his face, you know, like, why not? And I said, because it's not good enough. <laughs> so he actually even still marks that time that you know, he, he began to discern that there was a difference. There was something having to do with, he couldn't, you know, name it as quality or, you know, I said, just call it opinion. You know, that was my opinion then. I could change my mine later. Anyway, I do want to mention something about the, the, in the Roy stories. Yes, Roy is the, is the focus. You know, it's his voice. Uh, it's his activities that we follow. But in fact, the mother, who's named Kitty, is quite prominent throughout these stories. In fact, in the middle of it is a, a little novel called Wyoming, which is just dialogue between Roy as a child of eight or nine and the mother, Kitty, as they're driving in a car. It's entirely hermetic in that way. And they're driving through the South and the Midwest and it's all conversation. But the character of Kitty gets stronger and stronger. And as, the Roy's, as Roy's world goes on, there's more of her until in this recent book, the boy ran away to see she's really threatens to take over the way Perdita Durango threatened to take over Wild at Heart toward the end. That, you know, that often happens. And, you know, people come in and you realize they deserve their own book, you know? So Kitty's, you know, she got her own book right in the middle of the Roy stories. And, and, and what about your relationship uh, as you grow up with film? 
I'm sorry, I didn't hear all your, that. Your relationship with cinema as you grew up. Oh, yes. Uh, well, you know, I was left alone a lot to my own devices because we, I grew up in hotels. Uh, my mother and I moved around a lot. Um, I was born in Chicago in a hotel, the Seneca Hotel. And at the age of about nine or 10 months, we moved out to Key West, Florida, which became our other home at a hotel there. And uh, the Casa Marina, the old Casa Marina. And so we lived there and we were in New Orleans for a while in the old Roosevelt Hotel and in Jackson, Mississippi in the Heidelberg Hotel and basically wherever my mother had a boyfriend. And, and she had five husbands in her life too. So I got left alone a lot because, you know, she was out shopping, having <laughs> a good time. And so as a kid, you're left alone in a hotel room like that. And so I'd watch TV. So I'd watch the all night movies. So I familiarized myself basically, uh, you know, subconsciously really in understanding what narrative was all about and the three acts it took to tell a story, if you will. Uh, that's something Francis Coppola was always talking to me about, the three acts. He was wedded to the three acts. Well, I'm not really wedded to the three acts, but I got that whole narrative sensibility uh, driven into me by watching these old movies, mostly black and white films from the 30s and 40s and the 50s. And so movies became an enormous part of my life and how I saw the world and how other people saw the world. And, you know, it's continued to this day. Any, any questions? just curious about the choice of the narrators that you picked for the film, William Defoe and um, Lily Taylor and Matt Dillon, um, sort of evokes a certain era maybe in, in filmmaking, but I was just curious about those choices. Well, um, filmmaking is 50% hard work and 50% luck and 50% being in the right place at the right time. So. That's 150%. You have to figure out how to <laughs> do that equation. But anyway, um, when Barry first um, agreed to do the film and started to get excited about it, um, I recall one afternoon he gave me a call and he said, oh, you know, we should get, um, we should get Willem Dafoe to read some stories for your movie. I was like, yeah, that would be great. And then a couple days went by, and he gave me another call. And he's like, you know, we should get Matt Dillon to read some stories as well. So um, I mean, Barry hooked me up with them directly. Um, they're both good friends with him, and they know his work really, really well. So there was one really intense weekend when I flew out to Manhattan with my little digital recorder and basically recorded all of their stuff in you know, one session. Um, uh, to build on something that Barry just said, um, Kitty is a really important character and I knew that I needed a female narrator as well. Um, I really wanted Lily Taylor. Um, I've been in love with her works and Shortcuts, which I watched over and over and over again when I was in college. Um, and uh, she was born and grew up in Glencoe, Illinois. So she has this amazing Illinois accent in her voice. Uh, but at the same time, I didn't have a way to like get in touch with her. Uh, luckily, she and Matt had done a film together called Factotum, the Charles Bukowski uh, film. So um, at the end of the recording session with Matt, I sort of casually mentioned that I was thinking of you know, asking Lily to record some stories. And he was really excited about that, and he was able to put me in touch with her. So really, I'm just incredibly blessed as a filmmaker to have gotten to work with these three amazing actors who were absolutely perfect for the, for the part. How did it, we, have, we have to wrap it because I, they, they came to motion, but how did you approach Bob for, for uh, helping on, on, on this? I mean, how did you two uh, met, meet? For well, for Barry hooked us up. <laughs> you know, Barry and I have known each other for a while, and he 
called me up one day and said, there's this really interesting guy who's putting together a movie about me with an interesting premise, and we talked, and I got involved. I mean, I'm not, it's my first IMDb credit, so. <laughs> <laughs> Bob came at a really crucial time for the project, which was at the very beginning, because you always have to have that sort of seed money at the beginning to sort of allow you to, like, you know, get the train out of the station and get going. So thanks, Bob. You're welcome. Um, we need to, we need to um, uh, wrap this. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, uh, Barry Gifford, some of Barry Gifford's uh, books are for sale there. Uh, really do yourself a favor and get at least The Roid World. I mean, they're all great, but that's a, that's a, f it's a fantastic book and it's a fantastic way to end this evening. Um, thank you again for, for coming. Thanks. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Barry.